Thank you for joining me today as we begin our study. And I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to study together in the Word of God. We invite your Holy Spirit to be present with us as we open the pages of Holy Scripture and teach us what we need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. I've mentioned globalization, major issue, prophetically speaking. I would have never thought that globalization would be as significant as it is today. But from a Bible point of view, it uh, has its origins in the time of Nimrod. And I'm interested in this because I ran across a verse recently in Scripture which really made an impact on my mind. And if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17, I would like to show you from these words a few things that would, I think, help us understand what is happening in our world today from a prophetic point of view. These words are the words of Paul. He is speaking to the Greeks in Athens that ancient city. And he makes this very interesting comment. And he's talking about worship. Verse 24, he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. In other words, God is bigger than humanity by far. Verse 25, Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things. In other words, God is the ruler of all. God is the one who sustains and provides for all of us. Now notice verse 26. This is extremely interesting. God hath made of one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitations. What is habitation? Habitation is where we live. If you live, if you live in a certain place, that place is your habitation. If your home is in this particular town, that town and that home is your habitation. So God hath determined the bounds of their habitation. What is this talking about? This is very unusual language. Paul is actually referring to an event that took place many, many hundreds of years before, well, even thousands of years before. Um, Paul is referring to the time of Nimrod when he built the Tower of Babel. I'd like you to think about this. Come to Genesis chapter 11. What is Paul speaking about when he says, God hath made of one blood all nations of men? After the flood or I should say during the flood, how many nations were there? During the flood, and for that matter, before the flood, how many nations were there? There was really only one. Everybody spoke the same language. Everybody had the similar culture or the same culture. Everyone had the same family relations. Yes, there were multitudes of people that were destroyed in the flood and they were developing a, their own anti-religious, anti-God culture. But, but underneath it all, there was really only one family. And from the time of the flood on through until the time of Babel, there was only one family, the family of Noah. Noah was the father of 
of his children and his grandchildren and their grandchildren and theirs and theirs and theirs until the earth had populated a, a, a lot of people. So there was one blood at the time of the Tower of Babel. And this project, of course, was in rebellion to God because God had instructed that all the people of the earth should scatter and replenish the whole earth, not concentrate in big cities. Nimrod's agenda was to unite the people in big cities. Why? That way he could control them. Because in the city you can control how people, you know, you know how they you can you, you can control where they live you can control where they shop you can control where they work you can control where they worship you can control everything how they get their utilities all these things are part of the city you get this in the country too nowadays because the city has pretty much expanded to the to the countryside as well but typically there's much more control, much more concentration, much more wickedness in the city than anywhere else. Not to say that those things don't exist in the country. It's just that it's, it's far more concentrated in cities. Anyway, God had instructed the people to scatter, not to concentrate. In fact, in verse 4 of chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, you read that they said... Let us make us a name in the last part of the verse, lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the whole earth. So in other words, they were opposed to God's plan of replenishing the earth. Verse 4 also says, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Why do they want to reach into heaven? The tower was built to escape another flood, of course. But why would it reach into heaven? Which heaven? Is this talking about the heaven all the way up where God is? Where, where, the, where, where, where the sanctuary and the throne is? No, of course not. It's talking about the first heaven. There are three heavens. The first heaven, which is the atmosphere around the earth where the clouds are and all of that. The second heaven is outer space. The third heaven is where God's throne is, where God's home is, where He resides, where His habitation is. So, Babel was a project to rebel against God, and they built a tower so that they could go up in there and research and figure out how rain develops so they could perhaps prevent another flood if they could figure it out. God wanted to destroy this work, so He confounded their languages. I want you to notice verse 1 says, The whole earth was one language and one speech. And then in verse 6 it says, The Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do. In other words, they are rebelling in this. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What does this mean? You see, because of their rebellion to God, their, the voice of the Holy Spirit was, was reduced because they couldn't hear His voice. They couldn't understand the voice of God. So as people turn their backs on God, the Holy Spirit has less and less influence on them until He can no longer restrain them in their wickedness. So when God says that they could no longer be restrained, which they have imagined to do, He's really telling us that the time of the Tower of Babel it was as wicked as the time before the flood. The thoughts and imaginations of men's hearts were only evil continually. And now he's saying it in different words, in a different way. But it's essentially the same thing. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So God said, go to, let us go down and confound their languages. 
What was God doing when he confounded their language? That they may not understand one another's speech? What was God doing? Yes, he was stopping the rebellion. In fact, in verse um, <clears throat> 8, it says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. In other words, they stopped building. They were building themselves a habitation. They were building themselves a place to live. There was going to be a giant city of Babel. And in fact, it was going to be the center of the United Kingdom. Not, I'm not talking about British kingdom. I'm talking about a united kingdom under the principles of paganism. They were trying to unite the world under Nimrod's religious leadership as well as his political and economic leadership. Because in verse 10, or rather in chapter 10, <coughs> um, it tells us about the big cities that Nimrod, Asher, and Canaan built. Sixteen of them, in fact. Now, the Bible says that God scattered them abroad on the face of all the earth. Now, we, look at, we compare this with what Paul said to the, to the uh, Greeks in Athens. He said, God has made of one blood all nations of men. So how did God do that? It was at the Tower of Babel. By scattering the people, he, or, or I should say by confounding their languages... He scattered them. That means that this little group of people who understood each other and had the same language went this way. And this group of people who understood the same language went this way. And this group of people went that way. And that group went that way. And in, in a matter of time, they had scattered abroad on the face of all the earth. Did God abandon those people? No, of course not. God doesn't abandon, even those who rebel against Him, He doesn't abandon them because He wants to win them, as you will see. God went with them and helped them to develop their culture, their language, their cultural personality, you know, some cultures are different than others, aren't they? Cultures tend to be very unique. And they express themselves in unique ways. God also helped them develop their ways of doing business, their social structures, their economic system, their mentality on many different things. God helped them develop this. You see, confounding the languages was only the beginning God was making of one blood all nations of men, it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Come back to Acts chapter 17, if you would, please. The reason God did this was so that men could dwell on all the face of the earth. You see, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 11 that God scattered them abroad on all the face of the earth. Now he's telling us, Paul is telling us, that God hath made them nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Why did God do this? Couldn't he just have brought a natural disaster and destroyed all those people? Yes, but that would have not served his purpose. I want you to notice God's purpose. We'll find that in chapter 16, verse 27. The Bible says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not very far from any one of us, every one of us. 
In other words, God's purpose in scattering the people was to give them another opportunity in mercy to them, not to destroy them, but in mercy to them, help them to come to a knowledge of God. If by chance they might Seek after God and, and maybe find Him. He's not very far, but, but, you know, when you are not being spiritually minded, God can be standing right next to you and you wouldn't even know it. If you're not interested in spiritual things, if you're not living in a way that the Holy Spirit can talk to your mind, no matter how close you are to God, you'll never see Him. You'll never understand Him. You'll never sense His presence. And so God had to do something. And God went with them, and in the process of time, He developed their cultures. And so the Bible says He hath determined the times before appointed. It's God who orchestrated all this. It's God who organized this over time. But in the last part of the verse, He says, in verse 26, He hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. You see, if God had not really separated the people with their language and their culture and their distinctive personalities and qualities, national qualities, they would have simply united together again to create another globalization a religious globalization that would again rebel against God. In other words, by creating vastly different cultures, God has set boundaries so that they cannot unite together. You see, they cannot come back together and create this globalization very easily. It's very difficult to globalize the world. It's extremely difficult. Why is that? It's because the nations don't cleave together. Um, <coughs> Daniel chapter 2 explains this. In fact, let's come over to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Daniel is explaining the vision to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, And whereas thou sawest iron, mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They'll mingle, but they won't really integrate. Does that sound familiar? With the flood of migrants coming into Europe, this gives us a very clear understanding of why they don't integrate. God has set the boundaries of their habitation. This is not talking about geographical boundaries. It's not talking about the national boundaries that you know here in Denmark or in Germany or anywhere else in the world. No, it's not talking about literal geographical boundaries. This is talking about cultural boundaries. God established cultural boundaries so that people would not mix very well together or that cultures would not mix very well together. This keeps globalization at bay. It's God's way of preventing globalization. And why is that important? Because globalization is a very significant prophetic matter. Because ultimately, everybody's going to worship the beast and his image. And if they don't, they will receive the penalties. That's why the penalties are in place. It's because it's not natural for cultures to mingle together. Now that sounds strange, isn't it? <laughs> Especially in our politically correct world today. The Bible is the most politically incorrect book you'll ever find. Yes, of course we have, we have mingling between cultures. 
You know, there, around the edges, there's always some interaction. And God needs interaction between the cultures. It was miraculous what God has done, actually. Because the mingling around the edges, whether it's by intermarriage or by business arrangements or by other factors, those, those developments... Um, are God's way of communicating between these cultural boundaries. And it's very interesting that in the time of the beginning of the Advent movement, for instance, God had already placed English language in many different parts of the world because the British Empire had colonized all over the world, and they had brought in key English-speaking areas all over Africa or at certain parts of Africa, um, Latin America, a little bit in Latin America, much less than in Africa. Of course, Australia, Hong Kong, um, and other places. Wherever the British Empire was, English became the key language which is the common language, and by the way, in globalization, that is the common language. In other words, globalization is trying to reverse what God has, has done. They try to bring back a common language. A common language is very important to globalization. So that common language is, is already chosen, and that language is English. I'm very sorry to tell you that here in Denmark. <laughs> And I'm very sorry to tell you that if you're from another non-English speaking culture, whether it's Romanian or German or Swedish or, or whatever else, whatever other term, whatever other language group uh, we are talking about. You see, God has an, a plan. And it's very interesting because I'm laying a foundation here. I want you to understand what God did back then so you can see the miracle of what He's doing now. It's incredible. Think about this. In verse 26, the Bible says, Paul says, Acts 17, verse 26, that God hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So does God intend to keep the nations separate? Or does God want to bring them together? You see, globalization in history has always been about bringing the people together rather than keeping them apart. The Greeks were very successful at this. They brought the nations under the Greek concept of wisdom the Greek concepts of society, and the Greek concepts of the political environment. In other words, the Greeks were perhaps the most successful of all, historically, in bringing cultures together. But that didn't last. And it wouldn't last. You wouldn't expect it to last. Um, Paul is telling us that God's purpose is to bring people to the knowledge of the Lord. And let's think about this for a minute. Verse 27 says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him. So God separated the cultures in order that He could check the rebellion of the Tower of Babel or of the people at that time. And now we've had several cycles in history of globalization attempts, none of which have succeeded. And now we come down to the end of time, and the final globalization is taking place once again. God has also another purpose. Watch this. Come to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And we'll begin reading with verse 6. This is a very familiar verse to Seventh-day Adventists. I want you to notice it says, 
And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now remember that um, when God separated the cultures and the languages at the Tower of Babel, he scattered them abroad on all the face of the earth. Now it says that he has a message to give to every one that dwells on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. By the way, what is, um, what is kindred? That's family, isn't it? And tongue, that's every language. So in other words, God is taking the first angel's message, and by the way, the first angel's message is linked to the second, and the second is linked to the third. So when you give the first, you also have to give the second and the third, if you're going to give the full message. Otherwise, it wouldn't be first. It would be the only. <laughs> anyway, what I'm getting at is that if we are giving the message that God has given to His people, the result is that all these nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples, all these different cultures, they will unite once again, not in a globalization, but in a message of righteousness by faith, which means obedience to the Ten Commandments. Um, you can read this in verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now notice, worship again comes through. If we're talking about the end of time, which is what the book of Revelation is all about, we're talking about the, the, um, the message that God has intended for His people in the last days. In other words, it's a message of worship. Whereas the global powers are going to unite a world religion or unite all the nations and kindreds and tongues of the earth in one religion, God's people will be making an appeal to every kindred, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to unite together around the message of God's truth. You see, the false powers of earth try to unite the cultures around a forced application of globalization, a legal or political globalization, which, of course, is buttressed by an economic one and educational globalization. <coughs> Just keep your finger in verse or chapter 14 and come over to chapter 13. Look at verse 7. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In other words, Rome is going to succeed at least to a certain point in establishing globalization of every kindred, tongue, and nation. He, Rome is going to do the exact opposite of what Nimrod was trying to do. Meanwhile, God's people will be giving a message that is designed to unite the people around God. All the nations, all the kindreds, all the tongues, all the cultures, and all the people. I've added cultures into that, haven't I? But the fact is that if you are going through all of those things, you're talking really about culture. The cultural boundaries are gone in the relationships that God is developing around the three angels' messages. So if you're living by the three angels' messages, you're going to come together under the great principles of God's, God's cultural relationships. I am so thankful for the many cultures that we have in the world. I believe that they are very interesting, and I enjoy cultures. I love to visit places with different cultures, 
And uh, I find that it's extremely interesting to see how they live and how they work and how they think, especially how they think. That's most interesting to me. But ultimately, God brings them together under the three angels' messages. God had to separate them so that they would stop their rebellion. But then, in the last days, He brings them back together again under the three angels' messages that He has ordained His church in the last days to give. I could only wish that every person, every member, every pastor was actually giving the three angels' messages. But it's not. It's not happening that way. God is going to have to do it in some other way. Perhaps that's why He has organizations like Light Channel and other entities that are giving the three angels' messages. But the last message is going to unite the cultures, but not around some political ideal, not around some economic advantages, not around some social action, but God is going to unite them around the truth, around the principles of His truth, the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the glory of God, or His character in the lives of His people. That's the principle that we need to understand. And that's the principle that I believe we must recognize and understand as we have studied these things today. The boundaries of their habitation involve a wide range of people groups all over the world. How many people groups are there today? I don't know how many. There's, I don't know how many languages there are. There must be thousands of them. And there's dialects, different dialects in some in some cultures there's there's many different languages and i am thankful for them because i believe that's god's way of keeping people interested in spiritual things or at least as best he can god has to work you know in ways that are unfamiliar to the human um the human statecraft the human political craft the human economic craft these things we, we know and understand, but we don't understand the ways of God as we should. And the Bible gives us a clear picture that in the last days, God will reunite those who are willing from every culture, every nation, every people around His great message. So may God bless you, my friends, and I hope that this has made your understanding of the times in which we live clearer, and the purpose of God in giving us the three angels' messages. So thank you for listening, and thank you for being here. Let's bow our heads and close our meeting. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the word of God and for the invitation of God to unite with Him in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. We've only talked about the first angel's message, but we see that in that very message is the call to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, every culture to unite with God in the principles of His kingdom. And Father in heaven, I thank you for what you have done, and I pray that you will guide us into the future. In Jesus' name, amen.